Hello, everybody. This is Vince and Hugo from Fractal Universe, and welcome to another episode of the Fractal Talks. Today, we have Linus Klausnitzer from Obsidius and Alkaloid with us. Hello, Linus. How are you doing? Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's a cool opportunity to be here. Very exciting. Uh, I'm doing very fine. I just had a photo shoot with Obsidius yesterday, uh, meeting the singer of our band for the very first time after one and a half years of pandemic. So uh, <laughs> I'm uh, have pretty good mood. Amazing. So yeah, first time you met with the, the whole band. That's quite unusual. Yeah, online we met like a hun hundreds of times, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but yeah. in one room it was the very first time. Yeah. Yeah, because your singer lives like in uh, in England, and the rest of the band is spread over Germany and Austria. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah. It's not easy to bring everybody together. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Especially in times like these. Talking about yeah. that, how have you been in the in the last two years since our tour together? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe people don't know, but we uh, have been on tour together uh, like two years ago. And it was the last Obscura tour that I did with Obscura. And it was also the last, uh, those were the last light shows I, I did. And I guess you did as well before the pan, before like before the first lockdowns. Did you play any shows after that? After that, yeah, we did uh, three shows for the release of our newest ah. record. Fortunately, we were able to do a release show and uh, two cool gigs after that. Oh, that's but uh, yeah, it's it's been a long time. Um, mm. Have you played any shows since that? No, you didn't. Yeah, I, I played some shows as a sessionist for. Uh, I played with Beyond the Black, uh, a German uh, uh, front woman um, kind of melodic metal band. And uh, I think that's it. I think those were all the shows. Yeah, one streaming concert with them and like two uh, uh, live shows in front of an audience sitting in. Um, how do you call it? A, a, like a beach booth that we have in Germany. That is like, uh, like if you go to the German North uh, North Sea, which is like uh, you have a beach there. But actually, it is so cold there that and so windy that it's not like any beach in Italy or Spain. You just uh, uh, there is so much wind that uh, a wind that you normally sit in like a kind of a beach booth and uh, yeah, you're, so you're surrounded by. Uh, by wood and uh, so yeah, so it's safe from the wind. And those were like standing in uh, in front of the stage, so everybody had uh, a poor social distancing in this way. Okay, uh, but yeah, that's the kind of concerts I was having in that in that times. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. But besides from that, um, I mean, uh, after after the tour that we did together, I. Uh, I left Obscura like uh, a month later, more or less. And uh, then the decision came up that uh, Raphael, Sebastian and I, we wanted to keep on playing music together. So we were starting with this new band, Obsidious. And uh, as you know, it takes quite some time to build up a band and to uh, like, I don't know, do like all the stuff that you need to do uh, when you build up a company is like, Finding a name, uh, making a logo, uh, what business model you want to have, uh, doing all the bureaucracy stuff behind it, uh, thinking about taxes, who will be in the company, and then uh, for, uh, then we needed to decide what kind of music we actually want to make, uh, uh, what will be the musicians in the band. It's, there were so many decisions to take, um, so that that took quite some time. And uh, I uh, wrote a lot of music during the pandemic and uh, so much stuff also that uh, I decided to make a solo record. Uh, uh, and I think it took the decision already when I left Obscura because I had a lot of material already back then that I wanted to work on um, that I knew wouldn't fit with uh, uh, Obsidian as well. And uh, yeah, besides that fact, what else did I do? I recorded an album with Eternity's End, which is the power metal band of uh, Christian Münzner. And uh, yeah, there will it, it, it's a very cool album. We put out a, a video clip also. And in April, we're going to play in Mexico. That's very exciting. I hope that will happen. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's, so that's like the, the uh, like summary, I guess. We recorded an album with Obsidius, and it will come out probably in autumn. So yeah, that's the summary, I guess. Awesome, because yeah, when you released the first single, uh, it was basically not even from a studio recording or something that 
was planned for an album. It was like one one off song or something like that. Because uh, I, I remember yeah. I read something like this is not finished or not like a, an album version or whatever. I mean, like the sample that we posted with Obsidious after we left Obscura. You, you mean that? Uh, or? No, I mean the first song when you released it. Iconic. People were asking, "Is it from an album or something that's going to be released?" And you said, "No, the album is not recorded yet or anything." Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now I know what you mean. Yeah, now, now I, I remember what the. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, we have started uh, recording the record. And we started with a single, and uh, and then there was like a little gap uh, until we. Okay. Could continue that's very true yeah so that song will be on the album also in that version but um yeah we made it before the other songs which was uh yeah not the easiest song to start with also i have to admit (laughs) (laughs) but it's one of the first songs we wrote together actually okay great yeah Yeah. i think we can jump into all of that stuff uh later on first of all hello to everybody in the chat um Thanks for joining. If you have some questions for Linus, feel free to ask them. We'll be happy to, to try to answer that. And uh, oh, yeah, first of all, yeah. maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about how you started uh, playing music. What gave you the, the drive to, to play music and why bass? Oh, yeah. Um, first of all, uh, I just read Joyce's comment. Thanks for liking Sense of Lust. I'm very happy about that. Um, I started uh, very early on. My parents are both musicians. Um, they like I have two two brothers, and they try to introduce everybody to music and see uh, how they feel playing music and how they connect to it. And it seemed in the beginning nobody was really interested. I, I started to play violin when I was I don't know five six years old, and I uh, was just. Uh, a, I went to the violin lessons, my first violin lessons, and I, I was not paying attention at all. I was hitting my violin, uh, violin on the head, running like an idiot. But yeah, it didn't work. Out. I didn't have the patience, I guess. And uh, then later, it, I, I think they realized that I was in kind of an like a, a little bit of a dreamer, an introvert person. Uh, and I guess that's the case with a lot of metal musicians. If you like from. A lot of people that I talked with, it was like that. And um, so they, and then they saw some connection with the music I didn't know. And uh, I was playing you know, trumpet first. I started with trumpet because that's what I wanted to do. And I played piano also, but it, I didn't have a lot of passion for it. The only thing that I really enjoyed was playing the trumpet in a school big band. And that's this way I. Uh, Got connected the first time with funk music, I think, and we uh, and uh, like to have that kind of band feeling. We went like on uh, rehearsal weekends with the school, and you know how it is. Like uh, I don't know, a lot of guys making music together all day, and uh, uh, when we were supposed to bed, we just made some bullshit on on the hallways and had fun. It's like basically being on tour. <laughs> well, those were the kind of first experiences that. Uh, I think led me to that what I enjoy now, and uh, I uh, was playing the trumpet even though I was not very into it. And uh, I always uh, uh, thought that the basses there was a, a bass player already in the in the big band. I always liked his job more, and I always liked his his job there, being in the back and uh, I, I I don't know. I, I like the sound and the edi- and that attitude behind that instrument and. Um, then I got bracelets, and I don't know, uh, uh, Vince, if, uh, you played uh, saxophone probably also as a teenager already, right? Uh, no, actually, I started like ah. two years ago. Ah, <laughs> so, that's interesting. Okay. So, no, not at all. Kind of reverse way. I was going to ask if you're still playing the trumpet. Uh, no, 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 it's somewhere right? in the cellar, but yeah. But uh, what I wanted to say is I, I got bracelets at the yeah. time, and I couldn't play, and I thought like maybe you went oh, through yeah. the same thing, but obviously not. <laughs> um, yeah, so because you have like put the trumpet uh, very close to your mouth and it's like hurt as hell and I could like produce the the air that I wanted to uh, that I needed to. So uh, at the time I was already starting to be a metalhead and then I used the opportunity. I was in a musical school and I uh, had to play an instrument. It was like a, a, a requirement of that uh, on that school that I was on. 
and uh, then I took the chance and uh, started bass guitar. Uh, and then I had like my friends listening to metal, starting my first bands and all that stuff. And yeah, and then I went to a music college. Um, I played in a lot of bands, a lot of different genres. I still enjoy, I don't know, not only playing tech death. I, I enjoy a lot of different genres. That's also why I play in a, a band like Beyond the Black because I, I, I also enjoy those things. I play in a power metal band, a detective band, and a, a very commercial, like melodic metal band. Uh, and all that stuff is fun. And back then I did the same thing. I didn't like really li like death metal at all. But there was another guy on, on that music college, which is the drummer of Dark Fortress. Uh, um, and we were the only two metal guys. And at that point, I only listened to power metal like Stratovarius and uh, Sever Dash and uh, stuff like that. And he listened only to black metal uh, uh, at that time. And so it didn't really match. But you know how it is when if there is one other metal guy in the school, you hang out with him no matter what he <laughs> kind of metal he listens to. And uh, he had, and they needed a bass player in a band of uh, uh, that he played in. And that was no Euclid. So I just joined and uh, uh, because I wanted to try the music that sounded interesting. So that was like my, my choice why I did it. And then I started to understand like the, the aesthetic and uh, how uh, uh, great the compositions from uh, Flo were the main songwriter of that band. And I en started to enjoy it a lot. And that's actually the basis for all the um, yeah, connections that I made later to get into Obscura and uh, Alkaloid and uh, yeah, all of those kind of things. Because also the guitarist in that band was Victor Bullock, who recorded uh, yeah, more or less all the projects that I ever worked on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also a friend and uh, yeah. So that's that's how it all started, I guess. Uh, did you play? Yeah, yeah, so I, I didn't know. Did you play bass? No, no, no. It was such an old project and. Uh, was it, was it already with the that lineup, like with uh, Maureen and everybody involved also? Yeah, it didn't. I, I think the lineup never really changed except me and the singer quit at some point. But uh, yeah, it was our, our always, I think, uh, it was very fast clear that it will be like a niche, kind, a very uh, underground niche kind of thing because the singer was like a thrash metal singer and we play death metal and people didn't really like that and i think we were all horrible in pr so there was no internet was not really a thing back then except myspace maybe uh and yeah so it went into nothing but the cool thing was that um morian which is the artist name of florian martin smeyer the s singer of alkaloids and back then the main guy behind the nuclid also um he uh his main his day job is being a classical composer so um at some point he got like uh, requests for uh working like for composing classical pieces and um sometimes you get like a request whatever the hell you want to do if it's something uh, and no matter how weird your ideas are we want to go for it like try whatever you want uh, and then at some point he said okay cool can i bring my death metal band. And uh, yeah, that's how it started. That's when we uh, started to play with orchestras. And that was an amazing experience uh, Experience for me. Uh, we played with the uh, Metropole Orchestra um, that is very known in the Netherlands uh, from like old recordings with uh, Steve Vai to, uh, I, I don't know, I think with Temptation and all those kind of big uh, uh, symphonic bands played with them. Uh, I remember there's a, a recently I saw a Corey Wong video uh, where he plays with them. Um, it's a, a very good orchestra also, and that was a, 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 and Morian said like, okay, those are really really great musicians. They are used to play with the rock bands, so I'm gonna write something very difficult. And uh, yeah, it was difficult for everybody. And also the orchestra had really just they really had to struggle. And yeah, it was a fun time. And um, and then like two years later, my my father, who is the who's a conductor and a violinist, uh, he was um, also the head of an orchestra. And that orchestra was organizing a concert. And uh, they also searched for like a 
I don't know, like unconventional ideas what to do. And then we connected and thought about if we could, could do something together. And um, yeah, so and that led to the next uh, concert uh, that we played with an, with an orchestra uh, very close to Landshut, where the uh, studio victories and uh, I can remember, I think Hannes uh, uh, was at that concert. I didn't even know them. So like it, it dropped all the, uh, it got all the uh, local metal scene people uh, to the concert. And yeah, uh, that's also, I guess, how I got a name in, in, in that scene. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Also, of course, it meant a lot to me. I always went to concerts for my father. And then standing on the stage together is, of course, something very uh, emotional. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been a huge experience. Uh, yes. Is there any footage of that show? Remember seeing some excerpts only on YouTube from that second one? Oh god, yeah, that's such a, a horrifying topic. I uh, like there is a, a from those two concerts I just spoke about. There are um, like pieces that uh, Morian wrote, and we recorded them with an orchestra and. Uh, one of the uh, one of the pieces completely done, and the one that we did with the Metropolitan Orchestra uh, um, is a little bit complicated because the, it was a whole symphony orchestra. Like there was, we used all the instruments that they had in the symphony orchestra. There was even another band in there. Like there was another drummer, another bassist, another guitarist in that orchestra, and we used all of that. And uh, like I said, they had to struggle a lot with the material, so they. Uh, a lot of them played uh, not very well and you have like I don't know 150 tracks and you need to go through all the tracks and check them and edit them and that requires a lot of time that never was there because we um, we never had a great label and so there was never the I don't know chance to do that I, and I pushed it a lot of times and last uh, last year and during the pandemic when all the jobs went away, uh, we actually had another Skype call for two hours, how we could make that happen. And everybody was excited. And then uh, it, again, it didn't happen because something else came in between. So yeah, like the last concert we did together was 12 years ago. So I, oh, really? I don't think anybody cares for the material anymore. Uh, and I don't think it will ever see the light of day, it, which is very sad because I, I, I still think those pieces are very strong. Yeah, I definitely think some people would care, but yeah, I guess that it's really, yeah, really. Yeah, like, but I don't think that people know no nuclear <laughs> or something like that. But yeah, but of course, I, I, I think other people would share my opinion that those pieces are very cool. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. And uh, besides that, you uh, collaborated with your dad on other occasions, like you played on the last uh, on Delivium, right? Yeah, they, like there were uh, was it two. Just in one piece, I think I like uh, on the song Ethereal Skies that um, Raphael wrote mostly. Yeah. There uh, um, were, was a, a drink section, and we thought about how to do it. And then uh, uh, I liked again the idea of bringing in my father, and he came to the studio, and we, uh, and that was also a very intense uh, session. It was very fun. I think there's also some YouTube material how I'm standing with him in the studio we went through it and he's not he's a classical musician he's not used to be in the studio and like having a click on his ear <laughs> yeah, what's gonna oh, oh, yeah 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 <laughs> yeah that was uh interesting but yeah a very nice and sweet experience uh yeah it was very do you have fun. any plans of doing something like that again in the future uh i i, I don't know like my father is let me think I, he's like 70 eight now so um he pretty much retired from playing music so once in a while he picks his uh, uh violin but yeah I, I i don't know and corona doesn't make it more easy and uh, you never know but uh, like the the uh, corona thing doesn't make it more easy and also he's uh, which makes it even worse is that he's uh, uh not a fan of vaccinations and that of course is also uh, uh yeah, pain in the ass, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. that doesn't make it more easy. I would like it though. Yeah. Uh, Jack's frustration is asking how the new Alkaloid uh, record is coming along. That can bring us to this topic. What about Alkaloid? 
Yes, uh, that's a pretty recent topic to me because we are recording right now. Uh, we all do it. Uh, I mean, we are all session musicians and we work a lot from home um, doing session work for different people. So we're very used to record at home. Uh, Hannes has his own studio, the uh, Abordo Sound Studios. If you have a metal band and you consider having a great sound, uh, check it out. It's really a cool studio uh, in the center of Nuremberg where I also live. And uh, yeah, he recorded the drums already. Um, guitars are almost done. Uh, I'm done with the bass, except for there's one bass solo that I still need to do, and one song that is uh, not comp like there is a part still to be composed uh, on the guitars that I'm waiting for until I can start with the bass. But uh, that's uh, so yeah, that's gonna happen soon as well. Um, Vocals are not done yet, so yeah, let's see when we can finish that uh, that record because Hannes, just uh, our drummer and producer also for that record, just broke his arm and that uh, destroyed the whole schedule a little bit. And uh, yeah, let's see when when we can finish that record. But yeah, it, that's going to happen and the songs are great. I, I, and this time everybody uh, contributed song uh, songs. It's the first time I also had time to write a song for Alkaloid. Um, and it was a very cool thing because I never wrote ever with uh, Morian uh, together, and uh, we did it on that one song. That was very cool. Like, and I love that. But I, I don't know, you had maybe the same. I don't know how you write songs, but like that, that moment when you write a song and then you give it to somebody else, and he has completely different associations and works it to uh, like gives it another direction a little bit. I, I love when that happens, and um, that's what worked out on that song very well um yeah it's pretty exciting it's a very cool record i find from you have any idea uh, when it's gonna... vocals yet okay. but okay any idea when it's going to be released no we because I, I don't know when it will be finished and uh, yeah. uh you guys know but maybe the people in the chats don't know uh, right now it takes very long to release an album because the vinyl uh, productions take super long because they're all uh yeah, it's it's just uh, too much for them. I, uh, yeah, we learned it yeah. the hard way. <laughs> so if you want to release an album right now, you need at least to wait six months, at least six to nine months, uh, depending on the influence of your label. Also, uh, you need to wait for getting a vinyl done. So that's what putting the plan back a lot. Also with Obsidious, the album will come out in autumn. Even though we recorded. That we finished the recordings in August already, so it's like coming out over a year later than, and we finished the mix. The uh, it's weird. I don't know. No. Yeah. How was it with your re recent record? Did it um, was that finished on time, or did you have that vinyl problem already? Uh, we did have the vinyl problem. We released the record and released the vinyls like three months after. Uh, um, hmm. Because they Not didn't the tell us about some delays in the beginning. That was our problem. They told us we would receive them in like March or something, February or March. And by yeah. June, when the album dropped, we still had, hadn't had any news about that. And that's when we first learned about the huge delays and stuff like that. So I see. That was yeah. pretty bad. But I think, yeah, we it wasn't that catastrophic because we, we still released the album and people waited for, for the LPs and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing in that kind of scene, and that, that kind of scene, people are very understanding. Um, it's not that like, people will be angry if, you, if they get their record later. It's yeah. like having a vinyl is not about. Uh, I mean, they still can hear the songs; they just have not that physical experience. Then, uh, yeah. And uh, coming back to Alkaloid, uh, what's your uh, writing process like? Because you mentioned like working together, but is it like mm. remotely? Uh, do you send over pre-productions yeah. and work them? Yeah, it's how I wrote music always. Like um, in that kind of progressive music, I, I uh, we never wrote music in a, a rehearsal space or something like that. Like the only thing that once happened now with Obsidian is that we sat down and like we 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 discussed like for Obsidian when we defined the sound, like we listened to some different material. Rafi was sitting there with the guitar. We said, ah, that, that's something that's cool. And then, like, we started to collect ideas and to put the first shapes of a song together. But uh, I cannot play guitar very well. Um, 
And uh, I only have like this guitar that I can show you that one. This is a, I don't know if you can see how much dust is on there, <laughs> but it's like I, I use it once a year. It's a, an old Epiphone guitar, and when I play it, it's like a, a, like a hit a, a chord and it changes the tune while I'm playing it. So it's really, it's a horrible guitar. Can't see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I never, uh, but that's a good excuse not to learn guitar. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So uh, I never saw my passion playing guitar and uh, I like to play fast stuff, uh, fast material. And until the, I get to that point on guitar, it's like, it doesn't make sense. And so, I also will always play guitar like a bassist and not like a guitarist. So it's, yeah. Uh, when you, when you write a song, including drums and guitar, you just program it or? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I, I, uh, I changed my uh, writing process. During the years, first I wrote everything in Guitar Pro always because it's like um, you have everything together in one software. And uh, like now I'm at a, a moment where I start first on Guitar Pro actually, and then I go to Cubase like to get a better idea on how this sounds because very often I had that situation on Guitar Pro uh, that I wrote something and then I brought it to the band and they we started to work on it and then I realized okay that. Like that idea works on MIDI, but it doesn't work at all in real life. It doesn't feel right. That needs to be in a different tonality. It needs to be 10 p.m. slower because of the, for example, the attack that you have, like the moment until the tone comes, that you cannot hear that on Guitar Pro and those kind of things. So uh, and now I, I try to optimize my production to get as close to uh, to the real sound in the end as I can get, and that's by uh, I just use a, a, a drum machine. Uh, and then I. Uh, uh, got introduced to uh, virtual guitars from uh, our singer Javi. He has like uh, he introduced me to um, how's the company called again? Like the it's a VST plugin called uh, Real Eight, and then they have like an eight uh, eight string guitar plugin that I can use for simulating guitars at least a little bit. Yeah, and that's how I uh, uh, try to put. Uh, uh, little mini production together to get demos and stuff and then you can also like uh, use better with synthesizers and get an idea of like how i can support certain emotions and how they work in a song yeah and uh when i did that then i i send it when, when that is done i send it out to obsidious or to alkaloid and i see how they feel about it and uh for example morian had a strong uh uh I don't know. He, he heard that song that I wrote and he said, Oh, that I like a lot. Uh, I would like to play around a little bit on guitar with it. And uh, yes, uh, it is, a, I can say that already, it's a very uh, dark song, very like, uh, it's like compared to what I wrote before, a, a little bit primitive, like sense of last kind of uh, music, but a little bit like more old school death metal. Influence in there, like uh, a black bath kind of riffs are in there, and uh, and uh, I guess also like other like melodic death metal influences got in there, and then uh, Flo has like a uh, Morian has a complete different impact on it. He has like a more uh, he's such an own style and own vibe uh, that you put on it that is a little bit more rotten, and like he writes very ugly uh, in an ugly aesthetic, and I love that uh, and that fits. Yeah, he just tried a lot of, uh, uh, tried to add with his guitar a lot of stuff to the song. And actually, he even changed one riff to be the chorus that was actually the, the main riff in the beginning. And they could switch the arrangement here and there. And it made sense the way he played it on guitar. So, like a guitar pro, that wouldn't have had any sense. But the way that he played it on guitar and sent it to me, it was great. And he added like layers, atmospherical layers with guitars on it, which I couldn't uh, simulate on uh, uh, Cubase or something like that. Very cool to do that, yeah. And then we, we and I think Hannes made also one suggestion. Then when he was in the studio with the drums to change one part, and that's it basically. Okay, and you mentioned yeah that you send the song either to Alkaloid or to Obsidian. How do you? decide uh, i mean how do you deal with having that many projects that you're involved in and how do you do, do you have a clear idea when you start composing for which project it's going to be or um well it, it it's hard to say because when i um 
maybe like uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there was this um, moment of, um, how do you say, when we wrote for Obscura, we were happy to have enough songs that we can put on, an, uh, on the record. So like, okay, we have 10 songs for record. Yes, let's go for it. And uh, we already, uh, I, I wouldn't say it, it is a formula, but still Obscure had certain trademarks. So, of course, when I started to write an Obscure song, I had certain things in my mind. And uh, before, yeah, until Diluvium, like every idea that I brought in, yeah, almost every idea that I brought in was uh, also used on an album. And when we started to write for a new record of Obscura already, uh, which happened like you know, a half year before I, I left, I think. We wanted to redefine our sound, uh, which is pretty interesting because now they go very, again back to the old sound. Um, but we needed to to redefine. We wanted to redefine ourselves and go way more in a less technical way. We wanted to concentrate more on writing more catchy parts, like not being softer in in, in any way or like writing super commercial or something like that. We just wanted to, uh, I don't know, shaping uh, uh, the trademarks a little bit better. And um, we wanted to try new things. So I, I started just to write. And at that moment, I just started to write from a feeling and just I, I tried different things. I was in a different mood, so I wrote this. And that, so like I forgot about those trademarks completely on purpose. And in that way, already uh, I started to write stuff where I realized, okay, that doesn't fit to Obscura at all. Uh, maybe I'll make a solo record at some point because that is a cool idea, but doesn't fit at all. And um, yeah, and uh, we shared different uh, uh, ideas with, uh, um, I shared a lot of ideas with Stefan also back then. And that, which was also one reason why, uh, why I left them because our ideas like really clashed. Um, and what do you want to say? Uh, yeah, and then I was at that moment that I didn't know how Obsidian will sound. We like we 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 had no idea. So I had like a couple of ideas that I just wrote for Obscura, and that I had some free time and just kept on writing stuff because I enjoyed that moment of having absolutely no uh, boundaries and having no uh, trademarks to concentrate on writing music. So I just started to write somewhere and see where it goes and uh, how I felt about it. And uh, when we started to shape the sound for Obsidius, which uh, took quite some time, uh, I realized, okay, there are a lot of songs that don't fit at all. Um, and then I, I kept on writing, uh, using them for the solo record, but it was not very clear always to me. I, uh, I always shared all my songs with Obsidius and Alkaloid, actually, because at some point, for example, uh, there will be a, so a song that could be like uh, the fourth single of uh, um, of the uh, Obsidius record that will come out. Um, that was a song that I wanted to write from a solo record and, and didn't even consider it for Obsidius. And then I sort of to the guys and they were like, and I like the ideas a lot. So, uh, and then we used it for Obsidian. So I, I didn't expect that. So I shared everything with everybody, and uh, yeah, that's that's how it went down. Uh, and for Acolyte, I wouldn't know how to write either. I just would show them ideas because it's all these styles are so different in that band, and that's also how I like it. I wouldn't like with the for uh, to write with the formula and Acolyte. I think. Okay. And writing your solo record. Uh, what's, what's it going to sound like? Is it like really bass oriented or not at all? Uh, I, I thought about that, but it, it's interesting enough. I, I think I write better bass lines on songs that I didn't compose. I have no idea why, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so it's uh, not very bass focused, actually. I don't write very bass focused. Um, so the music that uh, uh, like I, I collected now a lot of ideas that have like the same style and it's a little bit more like there are a, a couple of tech test songs on it like the typical obscure -ish kind of style there are one or two songs and i gave them a little bit of a new direction so it's not a, like an obscure ripoff thing but it's the kind of style that i wrote for also in the less obscure records because that's also the music that i like like egg pyrosis and like or, or tensepi roth like the main riffs that kind of 
riffing um, I, I really like, and that's still me. And um, the rest of the material is a little bit more, uh, like I, I, I tried to uh, bring in my melodic death metal influences. I, I guess a little bit more that I, I really liked. There's like more synths on it and um, a lot of like thrash metal riffs and verses that wouldn't fit to uh, any band that I, I play in. Uh, and that's how it's going to be. And uh, I have all the songs. I have a, a, a lyrical concept. I wrote all the lyrics, the music, everything is done. I already asked musicians to record it. So I have session musicians uh, who will do it. Um, great people. Uh, I'm very happy to the people that agreed to work on this. And it actually should be also recorded already now. Uh, like the recording process should happen right now, but uh, unfortunately, Hannes is the drummer on that record, and he just broke his arm, so yeah, that destroyed the recording uh, time frame a little bit. And yeah, let's see. But uh, my plan is also to release it to, uh, around the end of the year. It depends on how I will release it. I'm not sure about that yet. Okay, cool. Uh, the Punisher asks. What's your thoughts on the latest Obscura? I don't know if you listened to it. And... Uh, yeah, it uh, was funny because um, when was it? I think we met with Eternity's End uh, uh, here at my place. And we went to an Italian place, hung out, and uh, had some beers and drinks. And that was like a year ago. And uh, Chris and Hannes are also in Eternity's End when we hung out at my place. And Chris had already the new Obscura record with him on, a, uh, on his phone or hard drive or whatever. And then we were sitting in my uh, living room at one or two in the night and listened to the whole Obscura record way before it came out. And that was actually the only time I listened through that whole record. And um, my thoughts about it are I was quite surprised that it's a super technical record. I uh, really expected something way more simple, uh, also because I knew that actually Chris had that wish with his, uh, also with his hand problems, to go a little bit more uh, easy direction. But it also has absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with uh, the status of, uh, uh, of music that when, when I left Obscura, like the Compositions that were there, the point also from Stefan, had nothing to do with what it is now. Uh, and uh, like what you clearly hear, I, I, I think if you know Christian Mitzer, you know how much impact he has on that album. For me, it's like he's yeah. the guy behind that record and giving it like the, the style that it has. And I love Chris's writing style. So uh, his playing and his sound, I, I, he's killer. So, um, so yeah, that I like a lot. Uh, and Jeroen is also an amazing bass player. Very great tone always. Um, yeah, like I, I, I don't know. Of course, I I don't have a, like a very deep emotional connection. Listening to I, I won't listen to an obscure. Like, oh, that's cool. Like I, it, of course, it was also a little bit of a hurtful uh, experience to leave the band. And I I would enjoy listening to a new obscure record. I think maybe in ten years or so. I don't know. But uh, yeah, Chris did a good job, and uh, it's. Uh, I don't wish them anything bad. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like that uh, people seem to like it, I think. Yeah, I think you, you're right. You can definitely hear that Christian has a huge influence in that record, a huge contribution. And uh, yeah, yeah. which said, I really enjoyed. And I, I, I yeah, and I really enjoyed he brought in a lot of influences that were uh, like a no go for Obscura before or would have been a no go. Like a lot of like, Super power metalish kind of like a running <laughs> wild riff is in there, the, uh, like in the style of running wild, or like there's the I hear like it flats from the Bark at the Moon guitar solo from Ozzy and stuff like that. And that is something I really like that the power metal influence in there is pretty cool, I find. And we had another question from the chat. Uh, sure. Linus, who is the woman in the Sense of Lust video? Uh, that is a uh, friend, is it one of the girlfriends? No, it's not a girlfriend from us. It's a uh, a friend of the singer and uh the song I, I like i was not involved in the concept of uh of the video making a lot of the visuals and the lyrics but i know it was uh, about bdsm and i think like that she also comes from that kind of scene and that's why she, uh, the, i came up with the idea of 
uh, using her for the video. Uh, I think that's what it is, yeah. All right. Do I do a guest sax solo on the new record? No, that's not planned. <laughs> <laughs> But for, for what record for the uh, I, I have no idea, but uh, <laughs> I could. either way. <laughs> but the Obsidian record is done, unfortunately, already. Yeah. And do you have any plans of playing live with these bands, be it Alkaloid or Obsidian? Uh, with Alkaloid, I'm not so sure. Uh, every time we played with Alkaloid, we, we never played a huge tour or something like that. We always liked to, since everybody's so busy with other stuff. Um, like uh, I'm very busy with Obsidius now, um, and it used to be very busy with Obscura. Chris is now back in Obscura, so uh, he's also busy with that. Hannes is the drummer of Tripticon that uh, takes a lot of time. He has a studio. Uh, Flo is very busy being a classical composer. So it was always tough to plan a big tour or something like that. And um, we always played like, uh, but we always had the cool opportunities to play very special shows. We have um, played some cool festivals, and I remember a tour through uh, I uh, through Ireland uh, after the first record. And we played as the first German death metal band in Egypt, which was an amazing experience. Uh, those kind of things we enjoyed a lot, and I, I think it's there's a, again a special opportunity to play live. We will do it. We like to play live together, and I think we're. The songs work also very well live. And with Obsidius, we want to play live, but you know how it is with the corona situation. Um, all the clubs and tours are more or less booked already. And we're a new band and people don't know what to expect. Like, no festival will book you if they have no idea how what impact your album will have and how people react to it. Um, and uh, yeah, but we have the first shows booked already. Um, the first. Uh, show we have already announced it is uh, the metal days festival in slovenia which Ooh. i like a lot i played there with uh obscura i played there with alkaloid already and now with obsidian it's pretty cool i it's very cool there did you play there already uh yeah we did yeah uh, it's cool right 2017 yeah it's, a, it's an amazing one yeah uh, all week there afterwards uh, are you weather the whole week uh yeah after after the show because we played on the New Forces stage, like the the stage that is uh, the camping. We played there on the Sunday night for crowded uh, audience, yeah. and then we we spent the whole week on the festival. So yeah, it's super cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if uh, anybody in the chat was there already, but it's cool people. The nature around there is absolutely incredible. Uh, and the lineups are great for that festival. Most of the time, I find it's very. I enjoy that festival a lot. Yeah, it's just uh, super rough uh, weather conditions. Actually, funny funny story is that uh, the night after we played, there was a huge storm, and oh. the stage on which we played collapsed. So basically, all the shows <laughs> on the day after were cancelled or rescheduled for the. Yeah, uh, we never heard about the smaller yeah. stage because we had to rebuild everything and stuff like that. So ah, we were yeah, quite lucky there. Okay. Yeah, because it's but very uh, hot did it, did and it very rainy, on? and uh, <laughs> like, was it falling apart while the band was playing? No, 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 no. It was during okay. the night. Uh, I think, yeah, like uh, because there were uh, there was a huge storm with a lot of wind and stuff like that, and okay. it ripped away some kind of, some pieces of the stage. And I don't exactly know, but uh, I know all the the shows on the day after were cancelled. Well, at least we scheduled uh, during the week. Okay. Yeah, maybe I was maybe I have only good memories about the festival because every time I went there it was very hot and I enjoyed having a beer in the cold water. In the <laughs> so yeah. yeah but it, I never made all, it into the, the water. The weather was horrible the whole week now. Sorry? The weather was no, no. horrible the whole week now. No, it was really changing fast because it's like in the mountains, oh, so you okay. can have like a huge oh, rainstorm yeah. and yeah, then yeah, yeah. forty degrees and uh, yeah. <laughs> but no, it was not horrible all the way through, fortunately. Because yeah. we were camping there as well, so nice. Uh, uh, I'm reading. Uh, this obscure album is pretty special. Sad. It's as well composed as. It's not. Yeah, as well. I, mean, I mean, it's not. Uh, I don't find it sad that it's back to this style of cosmogenicism. Maybe I mean there are two musicians back from that time. Of course, it will sound a little bit like that. But uh, yeah, of course. Uh, the writing style from the last two records that came from other musicians are, of course, always gone. And Obscura was always a band that consists of a lot of composers. So it was never like one guy writing one record, except the first record, I think, that Steph mostly wrote. But 
So it will always sound like the people that are in the band. The yeah, band, that's what I like about these records because each one is really sounds like the musicians playing on it. And that's yeah, really cool. I think in that kind of genre, it's, it's it's a good thing. Yeah, if you have like bands, like more traditional bands, it's not a good thing. Like Annihilator album sounds like Annihilator, Iced Earth sounds like Iced Earth. Those bands where one guy is behind a band mostly, they always have that one aesthetic, and that what makes them successful. But or accept or like. Uh, but uh, I think in our genre, people want uh, uh, like change, and that's yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's quite refreshing, and also, yeah. yeah. And uh, coming back to how you write music, he mm -hmm. mentioned like you don't really play the guitar. So, yeah. what does it usually start with your song? Do you have a melody in your head? Do you write on the computer, on the bass? Uh... Uh, it's always something else, actually. I I hate being in comfort zones. That's why I also don't like to write riffs on the bass because on the bass I most of the time go through my typical uh, like licks in my hands that like I go the way that feels comfortable in my hand and that's mostly what I do also when I improvise and then I like like I don't have surprise moments or anything like that um, so I, I don't know I don't doesn't surprise me. So I want to get out of my comfort zone and force myself to think differently. And that's why my composing methods are pretty different. And I always start with my main idea. Sometimes it's a rhythmical idea. Sometimes it's a, a, a bass roof. Sometimes it's a guitar lick or a chorus idea. It's, it's always different. But yeah, I try to get one idea and to, to work to go on from there. Yeah. OK. And uh, yeah, do you have a? Um... You have like a, a proper training in, in like sight reading, harmony, music theory, and stuff like that. Do you use that knowingly when you write, or is it more like intuitive or a mix of both? No, like the the stuff that I do intuitive uh, when I compose or when I play on stage, which which is also the reason why I recommend like knowing about music theory is that you. Uh, you know what you can when you improvise something or i just play like a little bass lick into it i know what notes will would sound horrible and which like probably makes sense uh, and that that helps me a lot like in the moment but composing yeah i like to use mu music theory a lot sometimes I like to get out of my comfort zone i even take like a music theory book and i i, I go through it like okay what like uh, how uh, what kind of chord changes i could use that uh like in, in jazz theory, there are uh, a, a lot of things are built on uh, on um, dominant seven chords, which doesn't work very well in metal. So I, I try to uh, think how I get more and uh, like I, I get ideas that are written in like a, a lot of major chords, and I think how to adapt like certain changes into a, a minor context into a, a diminished con uh, context. Yeah, and then I like it just. Go through the chord progression on Guitar Pro, like bah, and I hear, listen to them, and then I, uh, when I'm at the point that I think, ah, oh, that's an uh, that's a cool awkward uh, a chord progression, then I try to work with it. I sometimes like uh, um, write an arpeggio on it, and and it happened actually a couple of times, like for what was it? Uh, yeah. Any, anyway, once I uh, had a like a chord progression. And I wrote an arpeggio on it, and I sent it to to Raphael, and I said yeah, the arpeggio doesn't make any sense. I know it was it would be impossible to play on guitar, but is it is it is like the chord progression cool? He said live again. Chord uh, the arpeggio is very cool. I just need to uh, practice it. And then oh, he will do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Raphael is like that. It's very cool. But uh, yeah, I remember I take the like the note material from that chord material and uh, write riffs on it, and. Uh, yeah, there I learned also a lot from from Chris, who um, teached me like to uh, how to use my uh, knowledge that I had already in uh, music theory, how I can use it in metal music. Because I, I think Chris is very amazing doing that and uh, showed me some techniques, and I changed them for my writing style, and uh, I went from there. Yeah, so yeah, I enjoy that a lot, and I always try to. Uh, I don't know, bring in modulations and make tempo changes. So uh, also, uh, uh, Sebastian helped me a lot with rhythmical understandings and uh, like, uh, 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 yeah, how to make tempo changes the right way and give, uh, giving me ideas and also writing together on the arrangements for Obsidius, which took so much time. Oh, unbelievable. Um, <laughs> that helped a lot. Yeah, we 
wrote a lot of material. I, I told you we're like with Obscure, we had to already like, oh, great, we have enough songs for records. Oh, good, okay, we can make it to the deadline. And with Obsidious, we have, I don't know, 20 versions of 20 songs. <laughs> Uh, and then we picked what we found best. Uh. Yeah, it's funny uh, that you mentioned Chris because I, I don't know if you remember that, but I took lessons with him when yeah. I was a teenager, yeah. and uh, he taught me a lot about music theory, and I loved his approach yeah. and uh, his way of uh, incorporating <laughs> concepts that are not from metal into metal, as you said. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's uh, yeah. that has Is taught that also... me really a lot. Yeah, and is that how? How did you go from there, like to your writing process? How did you integrate that for you for your writing? Well, I think to me, like all the music theory I know is like uh, nourishing my vocabulary. I mm -hmm. basically these are colors I now know I can use, and now they come quite intuitively in the in the music. Like uh, I don't necessarily think about these concepts when I write. It's just things that I manage to add there because I've heard them so much, I've studied them yeah. so much, and just the way it works for me. Yeah, that's, Some, very, that's a very good way to do it. Yeah. That you described it like I, I discover a concept somehow, and I try to find a way to, to make it into, into a song or into metal. And uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but uh, that can be a, a way of, of having an, a new idea as well. Yeah, I think that's an, an, an amazing thing also that like uh, I cannot do as a uh, uh, since I play rhythm instrument and I have that kind of uh, uh, understanding for for chords like a guitarist says, for example, Raphael, if you if I say, OK, I have that chord progression for a chorus which starts with these chords and I don't know how to go on from there. And then he immediately looks like, like 10 ways that oh, yeah, that, that go lead to that chord or to that chord or to that chord. Oh, that would be nice. Like that, and that's kind of fast understanding, like you said, from from learning material and from studying like chord progressions over all the years on your instruments, like a different thing. I think on having like the also that that analy uh, analytical listening to uh, to other songs, like how, uh, paying attention to the chords always. I, I think that's a cool thing to uh, for a guitarist for for composing. Yeah, I think uh, guitar is quite a. A good instrument for composing Absolutely. because yeah it's a, it's a, both a rhythmical and a chordal instrument you can yeah. like blends with, with both and uh, I find it pretty convenient but uh, sometimes my ideas don't necessarily come from the guitar it's more like a, a drum groove or a melody or something like that so, but in general I think guitar or piano are perfect instruments for yeah, composing yeah, harmony well, yeah. and stuff like that yeah 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 but uh, how is it for you you said do, do you like this, 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 sit in bed and then there, you drive your car and there comes a melody or you sit down also and say okay make songwriting now what could i do <laughs> a little bit of both sometimes i'm like uh, in bed and i have a melody in mind so i just need to stand up again and grab a guitar and try yeah, to write it cool. down so i just remember it i'm, I'm not going to work on it or anything but i just want to remember it and sometimes i just sit down okay. like you said and try yeah uh, i want to compose something now uh, let's try <laughs> and sometimes yeah it turns out Comes out well. What about you? And those mel so those melodies that you have in your head in that moment, like are your purpose like laying in your bed and you think to oh I'm bored now I let's think about some ideas that could be a cool uh, a song or something like that or are you like uh, because that never happens to me I always need to sit down and write a song. Okay. So I try to understand like do you like uh, motivate yourself to get into those situations or does it happen naturally you just uh, no, no not really it's really my mind wandering it. sometimes <laughs> and uh, so something okay. pops up in my head I, don't, I can't really describe it but usually i'm like reading before bed or something like that so uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes something pops up there and uh, can't really describe it but that happens from time to time that's cool and I you like always to need to sit cool. down and, and you are like today i'm going to compose and that's how yeah. it works yeah, and I understand better when I have like uh, when it works and when not. Uh, and I realized uh, that in Corona times, it's hard, it was actually harder to compose because you have less inspiration. Because I understood, I I, I I'm understanding better what brings inspiration for writing music, and it's mostly like new experiences. For example, I can remember I I, I moved in the summer, uh, uh, 2020. I moved to this apartment here. And I, I don't know, just put my music equipment in here. And then at some point, I started to redecorate the room a little bit. And just the day of uh, uh, redecorating was super inspiring. And I sat down in the night, I started to compose again. And I had uh, 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 like the main idea, like an arrangement and a whole idea for a whole song. 
And I call that like room B as a working title because this, uh, I always call this the room B because it's the second room. And uh, yeah, and I, I, that made me realize, wait a second, it's really like just getting out, meeting people or going through the nature is the, those kind of things I find gives you uh, the best uh, inspiration or maybe in your case, reading a book in, in bed, which also drives your thoughts somewhere else than yeah, it would good. be if you would look Netflix and go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, it's sometimes hard to really understand how how composing yeah. works, basically, how this idea gets in your head first. I can pretty yeah. well understand how an idea shapes into a song because that's kind of an analytical and uh, like a conscious process, but the first spark yeah. of an idea is always something a little bit magical. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's very uh, thrilling. And it's also something that helps through the corona times because you have those moments of like being really thrilled, like you. And you have a good idea and you're into that and that you uh, stay awake long, you keep on working on the idea. And maybe on the next day you uh, hate that idea, but it's super fulfilling, I find. It's, and it helps. It's a very positive thing for uh, lockdown. So I don't know, people, wherever you are, compose, it's a, <laughs> it gives you a better mood. Yeah. Instead of watching the news, that. at least. Yeah, I think people need music right now in oh, yeah. times like these, new music to listen to. And, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, uh, do, do you practice every day? What, what does your practice no. uh, schedule look like? And No, I don't have any schedules anymore, unfortunately. Um, I, I really have, uh, I don't know, like I, I have a lot to do with the bass, like always recording, practicing. I have like, I play four different lights. I play live shows with four different bands this year. I have those session recordings, I have the composing, I have to record for my own bands. I need to make money with a with a half time job, and uh, so there is not a lot of time for practicing. Sometimes I just like spontaneously am pissed off that I don't have time to practice, and then I just carry a book out of my shelf. Like right now, for example, I have this book here on my uh, uh, on my table. Yeah, this like. Uh, uh, like uh, a fusion bass player from from America that's very cool, uh, Evan Marion, and I just play like some uh, um, some stuff from him and uh, yeah, try to understand his uh, different approaches to play playing and playing lines stuff like that. But it doesn't happen very often, to be honest. Do, do you guys both still practice a lot? Yeah, I try. Um, I try to practice all three instruments. I mean, guitar, saxophone, and vocals. Try to find like one hour for okay. each instrument every day. Every day, uh, and it works. Yeah, <laughs> kind oh, of. Cool. So, uh, yeah, trying to stick with that in order yeah, you're to. Also to... Ten, you're also more than ten years younger, I think. Than, than yeah, and uh, I'm and teaching music, <laughs> so I have more free time, maybe. And, uh, uh, trying to know. keep that. Uh, what about you, Hugo? Uh, I still do practice uh, on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, because if I want to be to still be able to play your fucking songs, Vince, <laughs> Vince I have to uh, to my, maintain my my level uh, quite regularly. So yeah, I do work uh, the guitar, but mostly Fractal Universe songs, uh, and and less uh, and <clears throat> less frequently some stuff from other bands or. And, and classical guitar, of course, that I still uh, try to uh, to play uh, when I can. Cool. Yeah, because here we go. You studied classical guitar. Yeah, I got mm -hmm. my uh, I got my diploma in the conservatory some years ago, and um, mm -hmm. I don't have any plans for it. <laughs> but uh, I think I I had this pretty pretty good level, and it will be a shame to to lose it. I think so. Yeah, I still. Uh, still take it some time and it's really relaxing for me to step away from screens just uh, read the the music score and only me and my guitar and with the the lights down and really like that mood and uh, sometimes I, I just need it yeah but that's very cool about it right you don't need like a but as a basis i always need a backing track i never play bass alone but there's no point about that so Every time I play bass, I sit in front of the computer. It's like uh, also that's something that I prefer to go through the woods instead of that. Uh, I have that <laughs> moment sometimes that yeah. I also like that. It's a very meditating thing, like to sit there in the evening, like uh, and that works better in the night. I find it like you have uh, like a beer or uh, 
a glass of wine, a yeah. of music, and <laughs> play an hour. It's amazing. I love it. Definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. The the classical classical. I I love the classical guitar because yeah, it's a uh, an instrument that can be played by by itself. No need uh, other musicians. It's the uh, it's the introvert instrument, uh, the perfect <laughs> introvert instrument. I think. <laughs> yeah, and if you put it on the computer and you do it on Twitch, you could even make money. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, it was a uh, yeah, talking about money. G give uh, people in the chat give some money to affect your universe yeah, for making this cool format. Good, good point. I uh, I Don't wanted to, to I wanted to thank uh, Claudia for your 20 euros. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I didn't even see that. We are we have a tour uh, at the end of the year and it will definitely cost us some money so any support is sure surely appreciated like, thank you very much yeah i really agree with what you said hugo because I, and the linus for me it's the same when i play the guitar it's always with a, with mm -hmm. a computer because yeah playing electric guitar on its on its own without a backing track without something happening is not like the classical guitar so <laughs> sometimes yeah. it would be great to come off from the computer but i find it like just not effective like to play with uh <laughs> yeah maybe maybe it would good to like because it when i started to play music it was very different you were like in your i can remember in, in the basement room that has had it as a kid i had my uh my i don't know my cd player and i put a cd in and i played to the cd it's a totally different feeling and i like the Wealthy, uh, the 40 year old kid that I was standing in front of the mirror, like trying to headbang, like on stage, like that kind of craziness that you're jumping around in your room and you play to the music you like. Uh, it's so far away from that feeling now, like, sitting at the computer, like, oh, put this playback here and then I open the Guitar Pro on the other screen. Um, uh huh. Like, it's so different. <laughs> uh, maybe it would be a good thing, like, to bring that back. Like, I have all these CDs still that I never use anymore, uh, still in my living room, and I uh, could put them and bring a bass in there. Maybe that's something that, yeah, like could uh, uh, get us away again from the screens, like going the analog way again. <laughs> Maybe that's what you need to do. I don't know. It's the same for saxophone. If you play saxophone on your own, because you cannot play chords on saxophone, yeah. it sounds empty. So it always need a backing yeah. track as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or like, uh, yeah, like, I don't know. Putting a CD and putting on yeah. just backing tracks and yeah, then just yeah, that would make totally sense. But yeah, yeah, definitely. It's. A, I Except. also find it very, very. Uh, I also started to. Uh, I always used to have, base uh, most of my bases in in cases, and then I changed that. I, I put them on purpose, like uh, uh, right here next to me, and also like here, so I can easily grab it and uh, like so i the mo getting the motivation to pick up an instrument to make it bigger so i do it more often and sometimes just sit down five minutes take the bass jam around a little bit and then i go again and uh, that's also very but a uh, good thing i find uh, i just saw the question what my half time yeah. job is i have uh, i am an it guy i studied media it so yeah that's what i do uh, three days a week, I uh, work for a phone contract company and I edit uh, uh, front end code. That's my like my half time job. And the other two days, I uh, yeah, most of the time I make session work. And that's also how like I try to keep up with my level like of playing. It's just like by recording nonstop and learning live sets. Uh, like uh, that keeps me busy always. Have you ever been like a full time musician, or did you always have this part time job? Uh, most of the time, I had a part-time job. Uh, once I was a complete freelancer, also in IT. So uh, there were, of course, times where I just did music for a long time, and then I just did again an IT project that brought in some money. But uh, living from music alone, I never did. No, no. Is that out of choice or? Yeah, I have like um, choice. I don't know. I never. A good question. I don't know if I. Uh... I, I mean, being a musician, you always need to make compromises and make money. Like, uh, like from only playing live, if you want to do that, then you need to be around, uh, on the road all the time, all the time. Or like from making money with albums, it's impossible. So that that's basically all you can do. And then it's like the the 
uh, kind of musician life that you can have is based on something else, then it's like being, I don't know, uh, producing, it is uh, teaching, all that kind of stuff. And that I also uh, see as a kind of side job. So um, that is related to music. Um, and I was teaching bass for a while, but um, I, and I also liked it, but uh, I also realized that when I started, like studying media T was because I wanted to uh, be, to have like a second thing that doesn't make me completely dependent on music because I didn't want to teach guitars. And let's, let's face it, on music schools, there are not a lot of bass students also. Um, yeah, and now I have a kid that doesn't live with me, so I need to pay for the kids. Uh, I mean, uh, I have my uh, my child here a lot of times, but still, um, uh, I need to pay for the kindergarten and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I need to pay the apartment, I need to pay the car, and picking my daughter up with the gasoline. I need to pay for the gasoline. It's um, yeah, a lot of things. So, uh, and to be quite honest, it's way more easy to make money with IT than with music, or uh, even with like music side jobs, just way more easy. And uh, always gave me like the uh, chance also just to half and half a year and just compose music, for example, which would be absolutely impossible with uh, without uh, that side job. Yeah. And how do you deal with tours with the side job? Do you get like vacations really easily? Yeah, that's why I started media IT because. IT guys are uh, wanted so much that I uh, really uh, it, it's not hard to get a job that uh, where you can be flexible. Like it, I discussed it at like uh, I had like I worked for three different companies as an employee and like with all in my whole uh, uh, IT career and all of them didn't make a problem about the touring. Yeah, that was never a problem. Never had to cancel a tour because of, uh, of that IT job, never. That's great. And speaking of tour, yes, since we were on that tour together, are there any yeah. particular memories you have from, from that particular tour? Any shows that stood out and uh, or any moments, whatever, <laughs> that comes to mind? Uh, I can remember starting the tour. That was pretty fun. I can also remember when we were hanging out and having some drinks in, I think it was Budapest, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And getting crazy sometimes in the two of us that was fun um some particular shows i can remember like the stages and how it looked but i i was very bad in like remembering what Ooh. image in my head was what city to be honest um but yeah i, I like the tour but I, I can also remember that in that time i was already struggling a little bit if i should like the, the thoughts of quitting obscure work coming up already like uh in that time frame so uh, it, it was a bit awkward for me. Uh, I, I didn't take it, any decision or something at that point, but I, I felt a little bit weird about the tour, uh, and I knew that there were problems and uh, that kind of stuff, and that like the new album would come and we are not on the same page and that kind of stuff. That was a bit weird. Um, but yeah, the lineup was very cool. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. Like, what are your what are your best memories? Yeah, first of all, it was our first tour, like in a nightliner and stuff like that. So these are things we'll never forget, <laughs> I guess. And yeah, it was uh, so cool and so relaxed. I think everybody was chill in the tour bus. Uh, yeah. Everybody was doing its part, loading the trailer and everything. So everything went super smoothly. I don't think we could yeah. hope for a better first tour. I don't know what you think, Hugo. Oh, are you muted or something? Yeah, we can't hear you. <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> I was muted. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. Uh, yeah, only, only amazing memories for sure. Uh, it was really exciting for us. The, the this whole big tour, this whole new cities, new countries for us. And yeah, all uh, all the people involved. Um, nobody caused any problems. Uh, everybody was nice and uh, funny and chill. So, yeah, yeah. couldn't have been uh, couldn't have been better. I think, and um, I think the 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 show in uh, Belgrade in Serbia oh, yeah. was amazing. <laughs> uh, they were all mm -hmm. uh, really great in uh, all their oh, yeah. their own ways. But that one, all the all the audience was here uh, at the very beginning of our show. We. We were the openers of the of that yeah. lineup, and of, uh, of course the last one in Lansut. That was great. 
Ja. Oh ja. Yeah. Yeah. That's of course also very special to me because it was my last show with the band. Ja, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can imagine, ja. Yeah. Uh, it was supposed to be another festival in, uh, I think it was, in, it was supposed to be in April or something like that. And uh, I, I, I can also remember that we discussed that we wanted to tell Stefan about the split after that show, like in person. And that didn't happen. And then it, need to happen, it needed to happen online because there was a complete lockdown. And that was also very uncomfortable, like having a situation like that without like talking person to person. We, of course, we had a phone call then, but that was very uncomfortable. Um, but it, there's something good about the tour that I also remember. I really remember that uh, I was super impressed how tight you guys were. Like what you had a very good lifestyle, how tight you were. That was really, I can remember that was stood, stood out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to, to Simon, I think, our sound guy, who is kind of a m magic... Nah, the sound guy doesn't make it tight. <laughs> he's a wizard. Yeah, of <laughs> no, course. But, he but, makes uh, you sound good. <laughs> but yeah, he's a wizard yeah. at what he does. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, he sounded really good. Yeah. Uh, and I think also that I like the fans, like really... Uh, I rarely saw an opening band that got so much appreciation like you guys said I, I think he really did a very good job uh, selling himself on the tour like it was very good I think well thank you thank you for the opportunity it was <laughs> really great yeah like, it went, like that went mostly through Stefan but uh, I think because he organized the whole touring lineup but uh, yeah it was not uh, of course we supported that idea yeah <laughs> I just want to take uh, uh, a few seconds to thank a lot uh, Tini our friend Cyril uh, for his donation of 25 euros and of course he just subscribed for 15 months so yeah that's huge <laughs> thank you very much and he said Linus made me do it so yes, thank you Linus thank you very much <laughs> thank you that was a good thing cool and uh, Briac hello Briac uh, asks us about uh, Danny in Alkaloid what are his composition skills well you talked about Christian's composition yeah. skills what about Danny uh, also Danny wrote a song for the record uh, a very very good one I find it's super fast super that's the most techy one probably on the record um, his approach I it, honestly I didn't I, I never wrote with Danny um, he contributed, I think, two songs for the uh, in the whole time of Alkaloid, and he did it with uh, Morion only. So I don't really know, to be honest. And Danny lives in another country. Uh, of course, we know each other well, but uh, uh, Chris is a very close friend of mine. He lives in like uh, four hours from here by car. Um, and we were in Obscura together and uh, went through a lot in that time and talked a lot about music theory. So I just know about Christian's uh, composition skill a lot, but how Danny writes songs, I don't really know, to be honest. I he, I have a lot of, uh, he also sends his ideas around with Vita Pro, the same uh, uh, like Hannes, by the way. And Chris also writes down his ideas on Vita Pro, only Morian uh, um, composes um, directly on guitar and records it. He doesn't. And then he writes uh, the sheet music for everybody. And there is one song that cost me so much uh, sweat on the upcoming record from Flo. It's absolutely insane. There is so much. Uh, it was so hard to record that beast and to understand the ideas behind it. It's like, and he really like uh, he composes for every single note that on any instrument. Like you can see that he's a classic composer because, like it's. Not about okay, the bass is just place a bass line like this. It's like really that it has uh, like a certain. It's always a mix of a melody and like for focus on bass frequencies it's written from a. It's like different than a normal guitarist. Was like very unique and hard to play for me because of that. And I but I enjoy that a lot. And I think uh, he did that a couple of times with this. Like uh, there's the call a song called Dyson Sphere, yeah. the first Obscura record, and it's like. Uh, uh, three songs were based on the first record, and I think on the second record there was two songs like moving on with the idea of the Dyson Sphere, and on the next record, the third record, there will be again a Dyson Sphere part, and that was uh, the one that really uh, so maybe the hardest track I had ever I needed I had ever recorded, maybe except some stuff on the Obsidian records, which was also absolutely insane. Also, like if there are any tech fans here, the Obsidian records. 
there's stuff on it. It's uh, yeah, it's unbelievable. That's how I you tease it's an really album. Difficult and uh, uh, yeah, crazy. Is it like hard on a technical level or just like conceptual? Because it's so out of your comfort zone, so to say. Both. It's it's both, and especially. I mean, like. Since we don't have any boundaries, we can like we we could do whatever the hell we wanted, and um, so especially like I, I actually was still on the mindset of okay, uh, how is it actually to write music that is not technical? And then I wrote like songs like Sense of Lust uh, that we worked on together, but like the uh, the initial ideas came from me, which is obviously like the uh, uh, just to explain it to people, Sense of Lust is the second single that we released with Obsidian. The first one was a song called Iconic that is way more technical. Um, yeah, so I went more like for, for the idea of getting somewhere else than technical. And but uh, Sebastian and Rafi were like, "Okay, we gonna we we don't need to follow any rules now. We we go as crazy as it can get now. Let's like let's see what we can do." And it was. <laughs> They, and they were sitting together and always like, what if we do this year? Oh, we could also do that. And then like it went like there is stuff that is uh, really insane, especially rhythmically. Um, I mean, both of them played in Pazablet, especially Sebastian for a very long time. Who knows? That kind of band knows what they do rhythmically. And there is a lot of that influence now on the New York City's record from like the rhythmical ideas. And Sebastian is a super uh is super great in writing rhythmical patterns and in, uh, in odd bar signatures and things like that so yeah and that gave it a very own vibe like um yeah uh, it's hard to talk about music it's like uh, weird to describe but uh, it's uh, to me it felt very new and refreshing and uh like writing in five and uh, a lot in five and gives the song a certain vibe that is yeah I don't know if you heard the song iconic already gives you a pretty and then like the two things that out gives you a pretty good idea already of like what's like what uh what kind of music we do on the record i think because there's some pick, surprises but yeah did you pick these two singles to represent like both extremes yeah what you do bit, or is it like yeah. a snippet for from the whole stuff yeah like, i think like the third song that will come out uh i think in uh one month maybe um that is even more crazy than the first one i think like, that's also super technical um but yeah like yeah we wanted to go through the extreme a little bit and the first song we just had the most the strongest feelings about it and every person uh we found a great manager and season of mist is super stoked about that record too which was uh very good of course for us as a start as a band um and um yeah when we showed them the record they were all like super focused on iconic and liked that track a lot and i think it also shows like what is very new to us uh and what i think is also in the genre very very new is like that power metal influence that we bring in like to have that clean singer and like really like loud synth and like that, that kind of thing. So I, I think that is very very uh, different to what we did before i think it's it's a little bit on Diluvium already. Like if there is gas, there is a you can hear that in a song like that already. But it's way more way more than in a song like Iconic. I find. I'm crazy. Can't wait to hear that. I think. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't wait to hear that. It sounds really crazy. Ah, uh, 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 thanks. Yeah, and there, I'm super stoked about the singer that we found. It's really now that I also met him personally yesterday. It's like a uh, great guy and. and unbelievable singer and uh, a talent that i have no idea why he is not uh i don't know has played in bigger bands already i don't know <laughs> how did you guys meet uh, because he has a youtube channel <laughs> i think uh, i've yeah. seen some of his videos even before he joined uh, obsidious ah that's funny is that how you you met him or how um, you got him? yeah like we when we thought about a singer, we already knew that it would be cool to have a deaf, uh, to have a singer that can do deaf and clean vocals. And um, I mean, like even like that high pitch, like uh, kind of high pitch vocals. We also wanted to 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 go for a little bit, and that's something that really not a lot of bands do. For example, Alkaloid has clean singing, but it's not that kind of. Um, 
clean, high singing. Like the, also the way you sing, for example, Vince, you also have the skill to do both uh, great, but it's, uh, it, it is very different. It is still something very dark. It's not that Wah! kind of uh, uh, vibrato kind of high singing. And uh, that's what we were uh, uh, had in our minds, I, I think, for that. And we just uh, started to write to some people with our. We had a manager already at that point, and he started. Uh, we like wrote a list of people, and he connected to people, and um, and we had uh, two songs, more or less finished, with, which was iconic, and uh, the third single that will come out, uh, that was more or less. Done. So we sent out those songs uh, to a couple of people, and they made an online audition. And uh, I was the one we agreed all, um, yeah, that it should be him. We had some um, online meetings, and so then we were sure that it would be cool because, of course, he's a he's a nurse in a hospital, and so he's quite busy also. And then, especially in Corona, uh, he's in the Corona department of a hospital, and. Uh, I mean, joining a band in, in that time, we were really like uh, uh, not sure if, we, and he works full time. So we were like, and he has also a job as a producer, actually. So we were like, in the beginning, a little bit skeptical. Can you really do this? It's like a time consuming thing to be in a band like that. Um, but fortunately, he agreed and everything worked out. And also, the, um, the thing that he is a producer it helps a lot, like through in the songwriting process, and like he uh, could only record remotely also because there was during the production was a lockdown, so he did it uh, from home from his uh, uh, studio. Went very very well, and also the cooperation like between uh, between him and our uh, producer that we all know well, but he didn't at all. And since they both were producers, like the communication was very good, and um, yeah, it was. A very cool choice, and I, I think like he had not, uh, he never played in a big band. He's like, a, he's actually from Spain, uh, and and has like a Spanish band called Juggernaut. You can like, if you check his uh, uh, channels, you can check a little bit for that band. But it has nothing to do with Obsidian, and also touring wise, he toured with them in uh, China, uh, but doesn't have uh, uh, like that touring background that the rest of us have. But uh, yeah, but. He has life experience, so yeah, that's all cool. And uh, yeah, he moved to England a couple of years ago, and um, yeah, and since like the Omicron variant and uh, Delta, everything started being it was really, really hard to <laughs> finally meet him. Yeah. And uh, regarding future live shows, uh, yeah. you tour as a four piece, like with just one guitar player. Do you have any plans of? Uh... It's actually more. something we are discussing right now. I, yeah, I can okay. imagine it right as a four piece in the beginning. Um, also, because of those reasons, because we said, okay, if we add somebody, we first need to know him. If we have a sessionist, then we still have the risk of like not meeting again because of Corona. And we are, of course, a new band. That means the financials are not uh, ideal, also. So, yeah, we needed to buy live equipment uh, and all that stuff. So we don't have uh, the capacities to, uh, I don't know, pay uh, uh, the money uh, to, a, to a sessionists that wants to learn. Like that kind of music is so time consuming to learn. And uh, yeah, so yeah, we, I think first we will go as a four piece lead and see where that, where that leads. Yeah, because it's going to be hard to find someone who plays Raphael's part, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I said, he really went crazy on that record. Yeah. It's like by far his best performance that I ever heard. And it's really. Yeah, I, I can guess that's not uh, a set list you can learn on one week or <laughs> for for like a regular regular session guitar player. Uh, I think yeah, your set list we will are, need. We, we are already happy if we can play that stuff. And it's like for an outsider coming in and doing that, it's yeah, probably even worse. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Yeah, that all sounds super exciting, and uh, you are involved in uh, also Eternity's end. Like you're playing with uh, with mm -hmm. Chris, you're playing on Hannes's solo records. Uh, it's like just one big friend uh, friend group, I think. Like uh, yeah. you're playing on each other's records. Uh, will the guys be playing on your solo record as well? You mentioned Hannes should be. Is Christian like as well playing guitar on it? Uh, Christian uh, didn't have time because he is on a obscure tour. Uh, 
actually, the reason why we play so much together is mostly because um, I like to work with people that, uh, first of all, that I know very well musically because I know how they sound, so I have an idea of what they do. And they, uh, and the reason why we're also good friends and make music together is because we have a very similar musical background. And uh, uh, like, especially with Chris, also he like when I went into Obscura, he was super excited at finding somebody who also has like started uh, with power metal and then went into death metal because that was always a struggle for Chris. Like, and he was I can remember when he put out his first solo record, like playing you know Nick of Ferguson and he played Obscura, and then you put out a, a, a like a super power metal solo record. He was like not sure how that will turn out. Uh, it turned out well, and the metal scene is always less conservative as people expect, but. Um, yeah, so that's like, uh, uh, yeah, and the, every time we work together, we also know that we can trust each other and rely on each other, that, uh, uh, I don't know, the projects are done on time, uh, we know how they like, what signals they have. It's a lot of musicians are not so reliable, uh, also very professional musicians that if you ask them for to come up with something, they take three months more than expected. and. And we are all very German, like, okay, you have this in time, you get it uh, the right way. Here are no mistakes. Uh, here you go. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, uh, one of the reasons why we like to play each, uh, so much together. And also, of course, like I said, we, we don't live too far away from each other, Hannes, uh, Chris, and me. Uh, I just met Hannes last week for dinner, for example, again. Um, and uh, yeah, and with. Sebastian and Raphael, it's a little bit different uh, because they live so far away, for example. It's not that I appreciate them less. And uh, and the singer for my solo record will also be um, yeah, somebody that I did already music with. But that is something I will announce in another moment, I think. <laughs> cool. Now, did you guys first meet like with Anis and Christian? Was it through non-Euclid? No, actually, it was uh, was through Obscura. I didn't know them oh. before. I um, yeah, actually, um, like the uh, Stefan was the first one from Obscura that I met. It was actually it's it was funny because the first time, like when I started in the Euclid, and I met them for the very first time in Lansuit on the rehearsal space for the very first time, and I was I don't know eighteen, nineteen. Um, uh, they had the same, uh, they were rehearsing in the same building like Obscura did. And I went outside with uh, Morian because he were, uh, had a cigarette. And uh, Stefan was standing outside as well. And he said, hey, you play in a new clip now? Oh, that's cool. Do you, uh, do you also play, I want to play in my band? <laughs> but I like met him for like two minutes. I don't know. No, I don't, I don't think so. I didn't know you, uh, and uh, I have already now a band, and I'm, I was busy at the time, and I lived somewhere else. So it was, yeah. So that was actually the first time, and then I was supposed to play, jump in for an obscure tour at a later point, which did work out because I think the original bass player could play the tour that originally he uh, thought he couldn't. And uh, Stefan always liked No Nuclear. He was in the classical concert that we did together, and then he. Uh, uh, and also Victor, of course, always, and Flo, uh, uh, that Stefan also knew. For example, uh, like Morian recorded also a guest solo on uh, Omnivium. And uh, uh, right after the recordings from Omnivium, it was clear that Jeroen would leave. And then uh, there were discussions, and they recommended me, and he remembered me through the nuclear. And then uh, uh, I met Stefan and Hannes in Nuremberg for having a dinner. And uh, I lived like in Erlangen before, which is like 30 km kilometers from here. Maybe that's why we never met. I don't know. And yeah, and from that point, like the first two that we did, I got very close with them, uh, with all of them actually. Uh, yeah, that's that's how it all uh, came up. And I just really, really like the music they compose. It's like also the Hannes solo records are one of my favorite records I ever played on. It's very I don't know the way that he. Right, so those uh, death metal riffs, I love them. Uh, his melodies that he makes, uh, I love them. Like the solo records that he does, it's like, I, I really, really love those. And I think it's super, uh, uh, like more people should know it. I think it's really, really strong music. 
and yeah. uh, he always like the productions are always good. The uh, guest musicians he finds are always the same. Like Marty Friedman on the last records was like a dream come come true for me because I'm a huge Marty Friedman fan. Playing on a song with him was really cool for me. For example, uh, which is an amazing song. They can dreams. It's like for people that want to listen to it. Ah, and coming back to eternity's ends. That's uh, um, because I just read it here. It said Phil is not in eternity's end anymore. Uh, yeah, Phil is also a really great guitarist. Uh, actually, I never played with him because he played on the second record, and on the second record of eternity's end, the bass player of Symphony X played. Uh, and the funny part is, by the way, that uh, I didn't play on the se second record because uh, Chris said, ah, once in a while I want to try another bassist and if I always play with you, Linus, my name is way too much associated with Obscura. So <laughs> maybe I'm trying to play with another bassist. So but that's not a problem now anymore. So I play on the third <laughs> record again. Um, yeah. And uh, but yeah, my role in Eternity's End is a very different one than in Obsidious or in Alkaloid because it's, I, I really that's Chris Band and uh, he composes everything. It's his, uh, um, it's just his baby. I, I, on the second record, Phil also had a lot of input, but yeah. And I, I don't write anything for Eternity's End, I basically just recorded the record. And uh, of course, I'm with the I'm, I'm the basis of the band, I'm not like uh. I'm so involved with everything, like in other bands, all the organizational stuff and so on. Okay. Um, A2. <laughs> so it's in Helsinki and uh, asks us, uh, ask you if you have some facts that you can reveal about the Alkaloid record. We discussed that a lot, I think, already. Anything else that comes to mind? Anything else about the new uh, Alkaloid record? Let me think. Well, um, it will have, let's see how many songs. So was it that we recorded? I think it will be, there's a lot, there's uh, a lot of catchy, like the, the uh, I think that like the last song, the first record, um, Funeral for a Continent, there are a lot of parts and songs that remind me of that song, that it will be uh, going a lot in that direction. I uh, just recorded also some bass videos, just jamming over those uh, chord progressions, but uh, that, of course, I cannot post yet. But that I enjoyed a lot. Uh, let's see, I have here the recording sessions open. Yeah, it will be a long record. Uh, it's, I think it will be 11 songs. And uh, one song was like 15 minutes or something like that. There will be, like I said, one very long song. Um, yeah, I, I think I wrote like this. Uh, it's not slow, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to like describe it. It's again really a cool mix. Uh, Chris wrote again a song for like for the second record. He didn't write a song. Um, he wrote an, uh, another song for this record though. That is in the style a little bit of the uh, title track of the first record, the Mac uh, of Grimoire. It's like in that kind of Tense, like very raw and uh, in your face. Um, very, very cool song. I, I enjoyed that a lot recording. Uh, what else can I say? Um, I think that's it. I play a little bit more fretted bass on that record. My attempt was a little bit to do what I do on fretless bass, a little bit more on a fretted bass, like trying to get the approach of writing melodies. Um, on a, I wanted to achieve that more on a fretted bass because I. The reason why I love so much on the playing on the fretless bass is because I love the phrasing. And it's like I, I can sing with that instrument better. And uh, I try to achieve that more on the fretless, uh, fretted bass. It's just like something I feel for me that I just want to uh, uh, work on. Uh, uh, work on. So uh, I think I have a, a very characteristic sound on the fretless. And I want to like somehow get that better on a fretted bass. That's just something I. It's just okay, well, a personal goal, I would say. So I play a little bit more fretted bass. Other than that, uh, the rhythm guitars on the second record uh, on the second record came almost all from Danny and Flo. And uh, on this one, it's mostly Flo and Chris. Chris plays a lot of rhythm guitars on the new record. Okay, why is that? Any particular reason? Um, it, it was uh, had a lot of reasons, but uh, it was. Uh, 
this time also very different because Hannes was actually driving to, he wanted to this time be part of the recording process. So Hannes drove to Chris and they hung out a couple of days and recorded some tracks. Um, yeah. Okay, and uh, Jeannie asks if you know the German band Death Row, that they are an influence. Death Row? No, I never heard of them, thrash band. Yeah, I don't listen to much of German thrash, to be honest, but uh, I will check it. Yeah, uh, if you can send a link, I'm always curious about those kind of things. What the what were the first metal bands you grew up listening to? Uh, it's all the like the obvious ones, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maiden was always my uh, was the one the band that I started with, and I like I think for the. First year, I almost only listened to that, and I saw Maiden ten times, and had all the CDs. And uh, like when Napster came up, I downloaded every little weird bootleg from the little shows from I don't know where they played on a Polish uh, uh, wedding in '88. I downloaded that, and uh, like it's uh, uh, yeah, I was a super uh, uh, Maiden nerd at that time. And uh, then I started to listen to a lot of hard rock, like Pretty Mates. I don't know if you know that band um that kind of stuff and then i got more because of here in the area there was a like a huge uh, cover metal scene like a, a lot of cover uh, bands were playing on the countryside uh like there's a band called justice here in this area and it has nothing to do with the french band justice and they uh played venues here in front of two or three thousand people here in this region every weekend so uh and they played just uh, metal uh, uh, covers and of course that's how i grew up like they had the alternative to go to discos or to those metal shows of course I went to those metal shows and uh yeah they played a lot of power metal there and that's how i got into stuff like gamma ray for example the gamma ray drummer danny zimmerman uh played in justice for example uh yeah so that that's that connection and yeah, that made power metal huge in this area. Like bands like Accept have always the biggest shows in the whole tour here in, in, in my area. It's just huge in this area. And uh, that's how I got into it. And uh, yeah, and then I got some connections. Like uh, I, I saw uh, like a horror show came out from Ice Earth while Steve George was on it. And I thought, oh, what's that bass sound? Incredible. And then, yeah. And then later with the music college, I got into more dark music and uh, I started to understand the aesthetics behind more Red Angel and kind of the chorus and oh, just great. And uh, yeah, but the stuff I mostly appreciate for like from the, like all the times, I guess, like I, I still like all the power metal stuff. I still, uh, for example, I enjoyed listening to the new Halloween record, stuff like that. I still do uh, enjoy that kind of style actually. And uh, yeah. Like the old school death metal stuff, death, uh, cannibal corpse, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, crash also like annihilator, uh, testament, uh, like the, all the big classics. I uh, the obvious ones. I don't have, uh, yeah, and uh, maybe funk music is a little bit unusual for a death metal bassist uh, or for metal bassists in general that I am now. Um, I like to listen to a lot of funk, and my first bass teacher was a. a like my first influential bass teacher, I would say, uh, he was a teach me stuff like Tower of Power, the Brecker Brothers, and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I also still enjoy that kind of music. I listen uh, 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 to a lot of uh, yeah, modern funk also that I, I enjoy a lot, like Dirty Loops and all that kind of stuff. That musicians kind of music I enjoy a lot, yeah. or the, the uh, Fearless Flyers and the Corey Wong stuff and all those things I enjoy also a lot. That's totally understandable from a bass player's perspective, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Liking yeah. funk music. And right. what are some bands that you that got you hooked recently? Asks the Punisher. Uh, let me open Spotify. <laughs> uh, check out a lot of new bands. Uh, oh yeah, there, but that's a very old school thing. Like Witch Hazel, somebody recommended recently to me. I got into that. Uh, that's funny and to, uh, we have the same management as vola i also didn't know vola yeah. like until last year and that was like a mind-blowing experience they are so amazing what a great band unbelievable and they're really getting big now and it's uh they deserve that so much uh what else yeah but uh, uh i also like the new porcupine tree song a lot um it's, it's like all the musician kind of typical stuff, right? 
Do you like the new Porcupine Tree song? I didn't even check it out. <laughs> Maybe ah, after. Okay. Yeah, me neither. Did you listen to the new Devin Townsend? That's also on my list. Like, uh, he made that the, the puzzle and uh, how's the other record called? Uh, yes, Nuggles. I also want to check out that. I always loved Devin Townsend super, super, super much. I think I've so. listened to the single, uh, but not the entire album. But I, I really liked the the single actually. Uh, is it the? Are we talking about the same album? Because I know he. He uh, he released the uh, CDs really frequently. So, wh which one are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. <laughs> no, he re he released like I think two albums at the same time now, which is the Puzzle and ah. uh, Snuggles. I no, think it was at the same time, right? Actually, I didn't uh, listen to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's on my list. Okay, yeah, and another singer, another like maybe that's something interesting. Uh, last year uh, or two years ago, I find out about uh, things Sebastian showed me. It's a singer called Casey Sable. I think very shortly he sung for Periphery. Uh, and that is very unique. I find he, like, he has like a way of combining uh, like metal guitars and like very high produced pop music in a, in a very unique way. And it's very catchy and modern, like in, a, in the kind of modern style. It's very unique. I find that's also something I enjoyed. Uh, in the kind of extreme metal, uh, I didn't check out so much recently. Um, but uh, and the new Cannibal Corpse, I find, for example, it's not so new anymore, I think. But also that one is a very good production. Eric Rutin is also killing it, I find. Uh, do you have any recommendations? May I, maybe I can put something on my playlist. <laughs> Yeah, the new Vola was great, I think, from last year, definitely. You already know yeah. that. <laughs> the one before, I liked even more, actually. Uh, what was it called again? I remember as well. But yeah, yeah, I knew the, the previous record already from them. Yeah. Um, apart from that, I recently discovered uh, like uh, Adam Neely's band. I don't know if you know the, the YouTuber, Adam Neely, who does like yeah, music-related yeah topics and he has a band called Sungazer, which I really really enjoy. It's like electro okay. jazz music. And I really like that. How is it called? Sun Laser? Sungazer. Sungazer, ah oh, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, honestly I always enjoyed his videos about <laughs> music theory and yeah. like you're talking about music a lot. But uh, uh, every time you play something with a band on YouTube, uh, I never liked it so, <laughs> <I always> like, <laughs> so it maybe it's not me, for you. but maybe I've been, I've never like checked it deeply just like the short clips that he posts. I will check that. That's a good advice. Yeah. Uh, and the album from Bola is called Applause of a Distant Crowd. That's oh, a yeah. very cool record I find. Yeah, I'm sorry, go on. Uh, Hugo, do you have any recommendations for us? Uh, recently I'm quite hooked to a band called Imperial Triumphant from New York New York, sorry. It's the like Extremely chaotic uh, black metal with um, heavy jazz influences, which sounds uh, really mm, contradictory. But it, the band managed to blend all these influences into something really interesting to my test, taste. And uh, yeah, the, there are like a power trio: uh, guitar singer, bass player, and drummer, which also plays uh, keyboards and. Yeah, it's really a, a strange blend of different m kind of music, and I really like it. Usually, I'm not really attracted attracted to uh, bands that are too much chaotic, but that one managed to hook me uh, for mm -hmm. several months now. They just released a, a live CD, which is uh, really great. An evening with Imperial Triumphant. Yep. Is it that one? That's one, yeah. That's the one. Yeah, I, I, the masks seem very familiar. I think I saw like artworks and like recommendations on social media, but I will check them out. Thanks. That's an interesting advice. Something interesting that the band itself is influenced by uh, their city, by uh, New York City. <laughs> mm. Like uh, the artwork is very uh, art deco. Uh, they're wearing masks of um, 
the Liberty Statue and things like that and all the jazz yeah, and right. okay. all the excitation nice. you can get in the on this city you can hear that in the music and it's quite interesting actually cool I guess if you have some more questions feel free to ask them um, Nibartini asks uh, have you ever played a Yamaha TRB 6P bass <laughs> Uh, I played Yamahas, and I uh, you know they don't come up every year with like 10 different series, but let me check that one. Of course, that model number, I don't know exactly. Is that your base, uh, Tini? I'm sorry? No, I, oh, I was asking yeah, yeah, the... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good question. The man, if, question. Uh, yeah, if it was his base by any chance. Because I know he's a bass player. Yeah, I, I think the last time I played a, a Yamaha bass it was for sure like eight or nine years ago. And I can remember I liked it a lot because they have a very full tone and um, a very like uh, also like the treble and the clicking noises are very strong. I can remember. But I always thought that it's better for other styles than metal. Um, but I could be very wrong about it. But then, like I said, it's like a, something that I remember from eight, nine years ago. I can imagine the bases changed in the meanwhile, or my thoughts about them changed. Another uh, gear related question here. Yeah. Regarding pickups, which is best between Bartolini and Nordstand? Um, I like both very much. I have, uh, so it's not an either or thing. Um, they just have very different characteristics. For example, this bass here is the one that I played most in my career, I think, and it's an old uh, BTB. Uh, it's uh, actually a, a custom fretless one, um, but uh, as you <laughs> can see, I played a lot. Um, it's not even a premium instrument. It's like a like a comparable instrument. It's still like a com little bit like the shapes that change a little bit. You can get it like for a thousand bucks. Um, and those are Bartolini picks up and pickups, and I love them for that fretless sound, like that warm sound that it has. I really, really uh, like that. Um, also, um, I, for example, if you listen to the Obscura records that I play on, I mostly have a very soft sound, and that comes from those Bartolinis on that fretless. Uh, on the other hand, if you listen, for example, to Sands of Lust with, that I recorded with Obsidius, and if you listen to the Obsidius record, Um, as you can see, this is another, that's a BTP Premium bass from Ibanez, uh, and that has Nostal pickups, and it's way more heavy, like, uh, it has way more, like, uh, uh, how do you say, it's more crunchy, more edgy, you could say. So, uh, yeah, it's just a different, different thing, and I love both, and I love, uh, for fretted basses, I love mostly those some pickups they are the best for me in that sense right now like like i have on this one here uh that's for my fretted bases the my absolute favorite one since the last two or three years um it's like a 20 years anniversary model from uh from that ibanez ptb and yeah it's recently they also brought out a new bases with a multi-scale that's something i would like also in this space but but besides that fact it's for me the perfect base here and uh yeah for a fretted base and not student pickups most and i know that also uh, they they uh have you now uh, just released new pickups they are uh from ibanez themselves and uh they are like uh yeah they have also used agila pickups and it's like somewhere between the not sounds and agila pickups they're a little bit more edgy but have a very uh, uh like not so edgy sound like the not sound have also it's cool but different that was a very base related question and boring for <laughs> everybody else. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. I like the question though. Thanks, Punisher. <laughs> How do you like your Ivaness uh, something? <laughs> e H V. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we have a very uh, a pr a private talk here now. Um, 
Yeah, that's a very cool one. I don't, uh, I just used that one actually for uh, like Ivan has asked me to record a couple, uh, like the Ivan distribution is just like 40 minutes from here. And I, uh, yeah, I have very good connection with them and I like them a lot. And uh, I uh, meet them often. And when they have new bases, I go there and check them out. And then they ask me if I can record stuff for them. And I often like take bases home and try them for a couple of weeks. Um, and that was one of those. I don't own it, um, but it was a very cool base. I can remember uh, that one. Yeah, I made a video for it. Uh, I remember, I can remember that I didn't take it in the end because, uh, like, the has the not some pickups that has the multi scale, but I, I think the reason why I didn't take it was because it's. Uh, for a uh, 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 like it is very God, how do you say it like the drinks uh, uh, like something like I don't, I don't know it's like nothing negative but they are like very brutal um, if you want to have a like a standing tone it's uh, it's very it's perfect for very dark music and for distorted basses and for like a very rhythmical and percussion kind of playing it is very good but that's not what I was searching for at that moment so uh, yeah. And what about amps? Do Other one, sorry, I just oh shoot, it's the headless on the back. Now that's another one. Sorry, I, I just keep it short for non basis. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is another EHP. That's the I also don't remember the exact names. It's the EHP uh, one thousand five SMS. So uh, also multi scale, but that has Bartolini's, Yeah, and that's uh, also a piccolo bass. It's very short uh, and small, uh, uh, like shorter than normal bass. And I enjoyed it a lot because uh, there's Attack is very fast there, and it's since it's short scale, it's more easy to play on it. And that's typically the base when I sit down to jam. I take this one <laughs> because it's the easiest to play on, and uh, then I have most fun with it if it's easy to play. But the sound is too soft for metal, I find. For pop and funk, I would use it all the time. I was going to ask regarding amps are you still using real amps or just sims nowadays? Uh, it depends extremely on the situation. Um, like I, um, like uh, for session work, I use plugins a lot. For life, I still like real amps, and uh, like because I don't like we play. Uh, I mean, most of the bands that I play with, we, we play in here, and I like to have that feeling of my leg shaking. Um, so uh, playing the bass without feeling the bass in your body is really unsatisfying. I find so. I play only with an amp normally or with a combination of a pedal and an amp. Uh, I really like the darkless pedals. Uh, I try to not use them too much because recently I, I really don't like that uh, the bass scene like is getting very focused on ding wall basses and darkless pedals right now, and every bass sounds the same. Uh, and those like the new DSP plugins are amazing. The darkless pedals they are all amazing, but everybody's using it and everybody sounds the same because of that. And that's really something that's like as I said, I don't want I like I'm not a fan of comfort zones. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I always try to think like to go other ways. All right. Any more questions from the chat before we wrap we wrap this up? It's been nearly two hours. So I want to thank you for joining us, Linus. It was really a pleasure talking to you. Uh, yeah. If you have yeah, some thanks. more questions, keep thanks them coming. For, <laughs> thanks again for having me. Uh, it was fun. And um, thanks for letting me talk about my music so much, which uh, it's uh, something I appreciate a lot. And if you want to follow what I do, so, so follow me. Feel free to so, follow me on my socials or the socials for my bands um, to keep updated what we're doing. We also have newsletters, which is always the best way to be connected. Also follow the newsletter of Fractal Universe uh, because it's, you know this social media platform comes and go, and, and or they don't show you what is where bands did not put money in and stuff like that. So newsletter is always the best way. And buy merch from Fractal Universe and give them more money on Twitch. And, <laughs> and buy merch from Obsidius and Alkaloid and stay tuned for the new records cross promotion, you see. Yeah. Anything <laughs> you want to sell here in the crowd? Anybody in the chat? What do you want to sell? <laughs> yeah.
uh, any Fractal Universe band updates so far? Well, we've been rehearsing songs from an upcoming record lately. Uh, some pre-projections are finished. We are rehearsing with the band and things are shaping slowly but surely. So yeah, definitely something coming up maybe next year if everything goes well. How is it about live shows with you this uh, year? Uh, this year, uh, our next show is in April. It's uh, in France. And then we have some festivals for the summer that hopefully will happen. Uh, well, and what most... festivals will play? We are allowed to play a couple of festivals. Maybe we can meet somewhere. Oh, so some are <laughs> one is not announced yet. And then it's some smaller okay. sky, uh, scale uh, festivals like uh, Cave Fest in, in Paris and uh, Amarok mm -hmm. Fest in Nantes. I don't think there are any uh, big names on there. I don't think you're playing there. No, I don't. I uh, have, like, like I said, one. I, I think one band that I play with. Uh, I probably I cannot announce that yet. But uh, I, I, yeah. let's see what festivals happen. But uh, there's going to be. Yeah, I will play again underground stuff this year and uh, big stuff. So and then mix in between and uh, maybe yeah. there's something where we, where we can meet. Let's see. And then we have the big tour with uh, Evergrey in uh, September, October. Ah, nice. Hopefully awesome. it will happen. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Cool. What, is, what is the whole package? Uh, Evergrey, then us, and uh, Virtual Symmetry has opened up. Virtual Symmetry. Uh, never heard of them. The prog band from Switzerland, I think. Uh -huh. Cool. We, we have really like excited a... about that. Hopefully, everything will happen according to plan. <laughs> we have like 12 cool. shows. In uh, Germany. Nice. Ah, <laughs> oh, is one in uh, Nuremberg or close here, like Summer Breeze? Uh, or let me check. Uh, <coughs> I, I know München is, uh, is. Yeah, it's like in there, but. Uh, know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know every city, so I don't quite. Yeah, yeah, same for me. <laughs> There's uh, Bremen, Stuttgart, Berlin, Hamburg, Oberhausen, Lindau, Munich, yeah. Uh, Hanover, Aschaffenburg, Mannheim, Trier, mm. Nür Nürnberg. Oh, there is Nürnberg. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second to last one. Uh, the, see, the venue is called Hirsch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you play there with Evergrey? Yeah. Yeah. The oh, that's a cool venue. 15th cool. of October. Cool, I wrote that down. Me oh, yeah, I didn't even remember we were playing there. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Sorry? I didn't even remember if we were playing ah. Nuremberg, so yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that should be close enough. Yeah, it's a nice city. I can guide you to some uh, touristic places and feed you with uh, heavy food that we have here. Uh, everything is very heavy here to eat. Actually, yeah, I know the city really well here. because my grandfather used to live there. So. <laughs> ah, yeah, I think we talked about that once, I think. Did we? Not sure. Anyway, yeah, okay, then. Um, Still a reason to eat heavy. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> when is uh, just reading when the Obsidian uh, album is coming up? I think we will announce it uh, pretty soon, probably with a third single that will come out in around a month. Uh, it will be in autumn, like we said, because of the final problems. With uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's done, and we you can see us uh, see some songs that will be not out yet in summer. <laughs> <laughs> which is an interesting uh, thing. So we will play some songs live that are not even out yet. Okay. Um, oh yeah, and the North American tour with Obscura was very cool in 2018. Very good memories, cool lineup, and uh, great crowds. Yeah. Except there's shows uh, where Stefan didn't have his passport, and we had to play without, and that was quite insane. But oh, that tour. <laughs> yeah, that tour. What was the okay. lineup again? Uh, it was the opener was in theory, uh, then Offspire, Beyond Creation, and then Obscura. Yeah, very cool. Like it, uh, real tech depth lineup, uh, super nice bands, and yeah, and it's like I can remember that, uh, like Stefan lost his passport, or got stolen. We still don't know, but then we had to cross a border uh, to Vancouver uh, to get to Vancouver. Uh, in the very beginning of the tour, needed to go without Stefan, and then in the night we had to organize uh, who would sing on those records and like play his guitars, uh, like search through all guitar demos with Steph uh, with a second guitar that we could play. 
uh, uh, to our music and um, we had guest singers from the other bands, even the bus driver from Beyond the Creation was singing and uh, Max Phelps that I saw here was here also at the show. He was singing uh, and it was really cool to see also how the package helped out there and it was really great and like we had to and I had to make the announcement on stage, which was my first time, which was weird for me. And a uh, uh, pretty uh, crazy experience. Uh, we had to make like four shows or something like that um, in that sense. And uh, and I was super nervous. And I can't even remember that. Uh, damn, how is the actor called again? Uh, yeah, Jason Momoa was on that show. Like, <laughs> <they're> <laughs> crazy. Also, and, uh, and Jacopo, our drop tech, burned his arm also, and we had to call an ambulance. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was all on the same day. It was a great day. He, he, yeah, he told us that story. Yeah. yeah, he told us. He was cooking some pasta, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Insane. Anyway. All right. Uh, once you said that maybe you will play some Obscura songs with Obsidious, are you still going to do that? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, it's just uh, we thought about it because it was hard, especially for me, now for everybody, to accept that uh, that part that we put into Obscura uh, is now gone for us. It was weird. And uh, it felt awkward that uh, like three out of four people still make music together and still writing the same kind of uh, uh, music together. Uh, we cannot use those songs anymore. So uh, I thought, like, oh, whatever, like, it's so much us. We uh, would be cool if we also could keep on doing the Obscura songs in the future. But now that we wrote the album, it's and, and it's the Leaving Obscura is so far away. It's uh, we won't do it for us. It's a new thing, and the singer is very different. It's it's a new thing, and that won't happen. Yeah, I understand that. All right, guys, I think. That should be it for today, unless there is anything else you want to say, Dinas. Once again, thank you so much. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, guys. And uh, get better, uh, Hugo. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. See you in October. Yeah, with pleasure. It will be awesome. All right. Cheers, people. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dinas. And see you next time. <laughs>